So my name is Naftali Tishbe. I'm a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I'm a physicist by training. And I've been working on bio biology and neuroscience, uh, or the boundary between computer science, physics, and biology since the 80s, essentially. I was invited to give a talk uh, at the colloquium here today, mainly because our work on the, the relationship between information theory and the information battling principle and deep learning is gaining a lot of attention. And uh, I was asked to give many talks, including this one. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, deep learning is actually an, a, a, an old technology which was really proposed that, as surprising as it sounds already in the 50s. And then it came again to, to the main, main, main stage in, in the 80s. In, in a slightly different way, which we call the shallow networks, which are essentially neural networks, or networks of neuron-like elements which are connected to each other in layers. It disappeared again in the 90s uh, by, by some other technology which took over. And then in, in the late 2000s, about 10 years ago, uh, a, a new version of neural networks, which we now call deep neural networks, which are essentially many, many layers of neurons connected to each other, many layers, even hundreds and thousands of layers, suddenly it become very important, became very important because, because it started to solve all the classical problems of artificial intelligence much better than anything else we, we saw before. So much better that it's even surprised the, the, the inventors of, of the networks and everybody involved. I mean, this is really surprising how well it worked. Indeed, the, the big surprise of deep neural networks was that the, the, they seem to be the same machine, essentially, or the same machine, the same architecture that was did the best possible, the best known until today at least, in both computer vision, uh, uh, speech recognition, language understanding, language translation, computational biology, robotics, uh, economy, and, and many, many other fields. So the surprise was that it's the same machine, essentially the same design, that works well in all of those different problems. And, and, uh, and uh, in some sense, we are already in the future. I mean, 10 years ago, this uh, technology took over and brought us something which some people didn't, didn't believe that they are going to see in their lifetime, like me, for example. I mean, speech recognition actually works. Computer vision begins to, to really work. I mean, we can recognize people by, you know, a glimpse of a, a picture in Facebook or something like this. Uh, we, it seems to start to do miracles in, in for example, autonomous, mobile, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, communication, uh, uh, language understanding and many th things which we couldn't believe uh, can happen. And in some sense, it's really uh, begin to deliver on the old promises of AI from the late uh, 50s and 60s. And AI is, is really getting to become uh, something real. It has a political and economical implications because it's, it's actually going to take the jobs of a lot of people. It's going to affect uh, uh, many professions. And I don't believe that any person in, in the Western world, at least, or in, in, in the modern world, who will not uh, be affected by, uh, directly or indirectly by, by this technology. So we are far from the dreams. And it will take maybe 50 or 100 years to really get close to what we call general AI, in my opinion. But we are already in, in a stage where this is affecting everyone at some level. And of course, controlling it and controlling the technology behind deep learning, which is machine learning and, and, and communication and, and databases and big data and all these buzzwords, uh, this is going to be a major f political and economic uh, uh, implication. The main criticism of deep learning by you know, engineers and, and people who actually use it, let's say in, in medicine or in economy or whatever, uh, is that we don't, there seem to be a puzzle, I mean, how they work. I mean, they really look like a black box in the sense that you put some input in it and you get some output and nobody understands what's going on inside. Uh, so one of my uh, recent uh, works, or, or I don't know if uh, better understanding or breakthroughs if you want, is that we are able, uh, maybe for the first time, to actually understand or look at the in, in t inside of, of this box and really get some idea what's going, what is the organizing principle and what exactly these networks really learn. It's, it's extremely important because you cannot convince, for example, the FDA in, the, in America I mean, to, to design, to accept a drug which was designed by a neural network where you don't understand uh, what are the risks and uh, under what condition it works and when it doesn't work, well, there are no guarantees on anything. So what we are really after, and that's the, 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 the job of people like me who are doing theory of deep learning, is to provide eventually mathematical guarantees on the performance, on what it can do on data never seen, 
or on what it can do in unexpected circumstances and so on. And, and this is really the major issue. And I think we are beginning to crack this black box. So the information bottleneck is essentially a, a theory or a, a mathematical framework that tell us how to extract the relevant information uh, uh, in, in a systematic uh, mathematical way. What, what, what is, in, in a short way, I can tell you that, in, in my understanding, the main part of learning in neural network is their ability to forget, not to learn, to forget the irrelevant details of the problem in a very efficient way. And it's done, surprisingly, by the same algorithm that everybody is using, some, by introducing noise, in some sense, into the learning. So this noise is allowing us to to ignore the irrelevant, the many irrelevant attributes or details of the problem. Uh, the idea of the bottleneck was actually invented for biology. It was actually invented for, for language understanding, uh, for speech recognition. But eventually it turns out that this is a general principle that is applicable, uh, can be applied to many systems in our brain. In the fact that deep learning can be explained by this was a surprise to me. I started to think about it only five years ago, but the principle applied to biology has been around since uh, 19, the 90s, essentially. So it, it's actually, deep learning is a new application of this principle, and it made it very famous, but, it, but it, this, the principle was there and it is used already by our group and many other groups in neuroscience, in cognitive science, in linguistics, in robotics, and in, in several other fields. Yeah. Oh, there are many. Actually, the field is, is moving so quickly and that with every month I see some new uh, applications and new, uh, and new challenges. So I think the biggest one is still uh, motor control. I mean, uh, uh, turning this uh, perceptual that is like vision or, or auditory systems into behavior. Uh, so, so things like uh, auto autonomous vehicle is actually a very interesting scientific challenge, not only an uh, engineering challenge because it has to deal with the unexpected humans on the roads and so many other things in a way which actually predicts the future. So my, my own opinion is that all the applications which require some sort of prediction into the future, for example, I think that improving weather predictions may be, may be done by deep learning today. We, we have some indications that deep learning can do better than what we currently are significantly better. Maybe doubling the, the time that we can predict the weather or, or, or improving uh, and uh, you know, uh, road congestion, <laughs> or, 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 or actually mo modeling uh, really large-scale phenomena like, like the whole traffic of the United States or something like this. This is going to be a real challenge and it's going to happen. But I think the most interesting one are the interaction with humans. I mean, like, like, like autonomous driving when there are both humans and machines on the road, or like schools, or like uh, education in general, or like, you know, arts in general, playing music. And there are many, many challenges in art, by the way, which are quite fascinating, and so on. It's, it's going to affect everything, eventually.